we didn't know how New Zealand was going to react. Most of us Muslims, as soon as we heard about that attack, and then the very first thing we were like, we hope it is not a Muslim who has done it. A lot of the families, they were refugees, and then they came to New Zealand as a safe place and to escape all the violence in their home countries. And for that to happen to, like, mainly immigrants, it was kind of, it was kind of really sad. I'm Sarai. And I'm Julie. This year, we travelled with our soundy Joey across Aotearoa to eavesdrop on immigrant whānau talking with their children. Every family we visited welcomed us, made us laugh, honestly made us cry. And over this series, we invite you too to listen in on Conversations with My Immigrant Parents. This episode of the podcast features Alian and his mum, Masuma, who live in East Auckland, where pretty much half the population were born overseas. Masuma is 36, making her our youngest parent on the series, and Alian is 13, making him the youngest child because he is actually a child. Alian's dad was home when we were recording, but he doesn't feature on the podcast. Masuma was raised in Pakistan and moved to Aotearoa in 1996 when she was 13, with her parents and four siblings, which means now that Alian has heaps of cousins here. Masuma grew up in Hamilton and Auckland. Alian was also born in Pakistan, actually. Um, the family were there on holiday at the time. But he's grown up here apart from one year when they moved back and lived in Pakistan. So let's hear from Masuma and Alian. My son Alian is 13 years old, so he has just started his college. His full name is Alian Abbas. He was born in Pakistan. Alian is a very outgoing child. He loves to interact with people, so a truly people's person. We share a lot of things in common. So we share the passion for food as well as traveling. And it's really great to have a child like him. Yeah, I'm pretty grateful. My mom's name is Musuma Mehdi. She was born in Karachi, Pakistan. She's like easy to relate to in a sense. She's really good at cooking, makes really good food. Um, it's easy to talk to. And yeah, she has her own business, catering business. That's pretty cool as well. She's really, really nice. And the worst thing, um, her driving's a bit... She drives very fast. Yes, so your name, Alia, comes from Arabic language and it means high or the highest or the exalted, which is really nice. However, it also has a special meanings because your grandmother, Dadi, she kept that name. And one of the things that you may not know about your name is that Dadi actually decided on this name the day we got married. Uh, you know how in Pakistani weddings they do poetry and there is a particular poetry about groom and bride and that is called Sehra. And you know how Dadi, she used to do poetry? Uh, so she actually wrote a whole poetry about me and about your dad, about Baba. And also she said that your offspring will be called Alian. So do you like your name? Yes. Do you ever feel like changing your name to something else? No, but everybody gets it wrong. <laughs> Why? <laughs> they, like, they pronounce it wrong. Do they and they it? never say it right at Starbucks. What did they say at Starbucks? Is that a lion? A lion? It's really not that hard to be honest. Okay. It's like Ali and Yan. <laughs> exactly. It's Ali, Ali, yeah. and Yan. Yeah, I don't know Ali, why they Yan. get it wrong all the time. Yeah. And uh, back at school, mm -hmm. all uh, the relievers get it wrong. And <laughs> mm -hmm. shall I just remind you that they used to call you alien? Yep. Some of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which was pretty funny. Don't remind like, me. Why would somebody name their son alien? Their son alien. <laughs> People don't understand. Yeah. Mm. Um, what's something you don't want to pass down to me that your parents did? 
Mm, that's an interesting question because when you're young, you feel like, oh, your parents are being too strict. My dad was probably really cautious, like, because he wasn't sure. It was a new culture, a new place, a new country for him. So he would be like, invite your friends, but you're not allowed to go and see them. We were not allowed to go and watch movies at cinemas. I'm not sure why it was a taboo, but like, you know, we were just not simply allowed to. I had never seen a cinema, I think, until I got married and like I went to watch a movie with your baba. I agree with most of the stuff. Obviously, like, all sleepovers are not, like, it's, like, not a no, like, I can go to me some Daniel's house and have a sleepover with them. Yeah. So it's, like, more, like, family. And that's family not a, sleepovers. Yeah, family know. sleepovers. And it's, like, more interaction with family. And I don't mind that. I like. I think I like that more because, I mean, family's family, right? You can't go wrong with that. Yeah. Like, you know, as you grow up, you will realize that there are sometimes that restrictions are there. But then also, I would have been probably a bit more flexible if you didn't have family here. And then you guys have the Skype channel yeah. as well, yeah. right? What is it? The Kazi? I can't remember. I think it was just a Kazi group. Yeah. The Kazi Fuzzies? No, that was that was old. We got rid of that one. Yeah. And I think it is the Habibis? No, no, no. Okay, what? right. Uh, nothing. It's fine. It's just called the Habibi. No, it's called something else. It's it's not called that anymore. The it's, kebab mm, Habibis? What? <laughs> Where'd that come from? <laughs> it's actually really cool, Alian. Um, Mama, drop it, please. Yes. When I was back at school in Pakistan... I was quite active with teachers and with the school management. And if I would have made it to the final year of school, I could have uh, been one of the head girls. Um, coming from a very active role at school and then coming to a school here, it was like such a drastic change. Um, I, I felt quite lonely, I remember. So it's nothing like what you experience now. I mean, because I hear a lot of school stories um, that you share with me on an everyday basis. And my school experience was like so different. So yes, I mean, first comes the language barrier, not because I can't speak English, I could speak English, but it just felt like everyone spoke another language just because of the accent. And they probably wouldn't understand my accent you know, and those days, as I said, like things were quite different for immigrants, you know, I mean, that's why I think it was just, we, we chose to sort of like stay within our own circle, our own family, because um, I was at uni when September 11 happened. And a lot of my friends who used to wear scarves, they took it off because of their safety. And I think I was, I'm not sure whether there were a few others, but I was the only one, as far as I remember, who continued wearing scarf. And yeah, and I'm glad that I did. And I mean, when I look back and even in the history, like about 40, 50 years ago, the ladies like in Britain, they used to cover their head with a hat and then they always had their skirts like down their knee and stuff. So I think it's not something so uncommon. And it used to be actually really depressing. And that's why I just remember when I used to come back from school, I would just, I would just actually wait for the school to finish and just come back home and home was like a place to seek peace and just sort of um a place which was more comfortable and this is when like you know sort of we like I will open up and talk and laugh and interact with my brothers which were like more like friends we will like you know um sort of um have lots of fun together but yeah, at school, I, I didn't really, in the beginning, didn't have much friends and stuff. Maybe at uni, it was a bit better. Bullying is obviously a big problem. I mean, it's pretty big. I mean, we can't sideline it. But I mean, I've never faced like a direct bully. But, but that is because you, are, you, you have got yeah. a stronger personality. But, That's why you can put up with it. Yeah, but as far as the terrorist thing goes, it was clearly a joke. I, I didn't take it to heart. So what was it? What happened? Um, it was just like, we were joking around about something and then we were talking about something. It was just kind of like a vague reference. And then uh, it's not something that I thought was really that important. 
or like you know but did it hurt you did it hit you um a little bit because little, you had good comebacks bit, for it right yeah a little bit but i mean i knew it wasn't something serious so i didn't like take it up with like a teacher or something but um i mean it does happen a lot i know a lot of other kids especially muslim kids have been called things like that i mean you can't really say that because just because i'm muslim doesn't mean i'm part of isis because i mean if you're christian you're part of kkk mm-hmm. but that's I mean, good you have specified it yeah so. but i don't think that's an issue as much cuz anybody can just throw around a word but it's like the action behind that How word how you take it i think this is really generous of alian to mm. give his friends the benefit of the doubt like that mm mm-hmm. um it also makes me sad that the things that were said to muslim are being said to alian as well yeah i think it's really hurtful to hear a 13 year old try to justify it mm. both in terms of saving face maybe in front of his friends but also so he personally doesn't take it to heart mm. yeah and i think i wouldn't even say that these would always be like white kids doing this yeah. i kind of think this is culture that poc kids internalize as well mm. and i think with my younger brother and his group of friends i think i've heard them throw away comments that are quite stereotypical and if they came from a white person you'd like immediately know that would not be okay but mm. there's something that they've internalized that is about beating down your own culture in order to survive be cool to fit in yeah. even when they're just amongst themselves yeah yeah it can sometimes be a thing of dragging yourself before someone else mm. does as well mm-hmm. mm. um we got aliana masuma to talk a bit about masuma's change of career and what that meant to Alian what that meant to their relationship. Masuma used to work at Work and Income and she now runs a catering business which makes South Asian foods and delivers them to people's homes. So, mum worked at Work and Income, right? And then after school, I'd come home and then we'd go and pick her up and then after that we'd come home. I don't know, in a sense like it was more of like a routine. in a sense but like now it's more flexible so it's better working back and working in income i had to come across lots of different people and it's like every half an hour you're meeting a new person and listening to their life story and stuff and then every morning you have to get up and put your hijab on and make sure your clothes are looking like sort of formal because we were supposed to wear like you know like a formal um smart formal dress and um with hijab it used to be a bit a bit challenging um to still keep it modest and still like you know sort of wear your formal attire and the staff that i usually keep is uh, usually muslim women as well within the kitchen it's like women only and it's very relaxing like so we start our day with putting quran in the background with translation and we listen to that for a while so it's really good that we have common interests and common stuff and then also we don't have to wear our hijabs like around women obviously and then we can be more relaxed especially in the hot days when it gets really hot in the kitchen what would you feel about hijab if you had to wear i mean you are 13 now i mean it would be like if you saw me in a crowd you probably wouldn't think i'm muslim or you wouldn't know but like oh being a boy yeah being yeah. a boy but then being a girl it's like you know you're kind of wearing a thing that says look at me i'm muslim i'm wearing a thing so it's like you, it's like you're you get, carrying a flag yeah you you, you kind of get more attention in that sense everybody looks at you and you're like oh look there's a muslim person mm. that mm. could be negative or that could be positive i mean mm. you definitely get more like you get asked more questions because Masuma and Alian are both muslim the terrorist attack on march 15 2019 is talked about quite a bit on this episode and we realize that we probably don't need to break down everything that happened on that day but just in case we've got a little reminder of what took place so on march 15th this year a white supremacist with a gun opened fire on al nur mosque in christchurch and then drove to Linwood Islamic Center and continued to kill people. He killed 51 people and injured 49. In this next part of the episode, Alian and Masuma talk about watching some of the video of the shooting on the day it happened before it was made illegal and before they understood exactly what it was they were watching. 
this is related to the uh the video of the live stream of the shooting so when i saw it i thought it was like i actually thought that um it was like it didn't feel real like when i saw it i was like oh this is just a clip from a game but then i realized soon that and i started looking i started noticing around the surroundings and looking mm. oh no this isn't a game this is real life Mm. and then it was it got deleted from social media everywhere and stuff and then we didn't see it anywhere but it was shown in um uh, on other um international media forums was, right yeah i mean it's it's not possible like especially even for like military personnel they go through psychological training for their minds to like not go insane but the person definitely like you can't just pick up a gun and walk into somewhere and shoot 50 people and have the correct state of mind i mean it's just like even if i say this to some random person on the street they'd probably agree with me now that some time has passed and we have spoken to so many people so many families of victims who were affected or who saw the whole thing happening you know on that day um or from imam jamal foda um like of course so now i can only reflect on those experiences and he was definitely like you know someone who was trained and um definitely someone who was in contact with um, other groups because he seemed to have been like talking to some people especially like you have seen Ellen how cute she is like she's such a little like you know cute girl and um if someone can shoot at her can do anything once we heard the mosque are locked down and Aliana is not going to go to uh, the school the Islamic school we were like okay we still have to go on with this farewell so we had to offer another venue other than the mosque so we shifted that farewell to our house and i remember everybody had like you know come in and they had already arrived and all of a sudden there was like a knock on the door like a unexpected knock mm-hmm. and i remember that like scared the hell yeah. out of me yeah, i was we like already scared. we were like who is at the door and then anyway we went and opened the door and there was just like somebody from our group who decided to turn up that they had said they were not going to come and they but i just remember how frightened we were i don't even trust the person like driving next to me or walking next to me and i'm not sure if that person is going to attack me so this was the vibe on friday night mm-hmm. and sort of half saturday but then things changed over the weekend right because yeah. we didn't know how new zealand was going to react most of us muslims were as soon as we heard about that attack and then it sort of sinked in and we were like okay this has happened the very first thing we were like we hope it is not a muslim who has done it and i think how people have become after 15 march like more awareness and more support i just feel it's really really important that we continue on doing that um like let's not forget um what happened and let's remember because it's not the first time people got shot or like something really ordeal like this has happened in the world kind of think we have to acknowledge here that it is still so hard to find language for what happened in Christchurch like even sitting here now neither Julie or I are muslim so we can't relate to what the muslim community have been going through it's completely different um but still yeah we can't really reconcile that so many people died here from the attack yeah yeah um and then you hear people like Masuma talk and it's similar to what Alian had before this like desire to forgive or to still show how grateful you are mm. and not show that things have gotten to you or that you're suffering because of what's happened and part of it is that pressure to be the grateful refugee the grateful immigrant to praise your new country to be a useful part of society or yeah. to excel as yeah. part of the society just no. because you're part of a society doesn't mean you can't criticize it mm. that's like the point of being a citizen but in saying that we don't want to ever judge 
immigrants, refugees, people of colour or other minorities for demonstrating that gratefulness because it's gracious yeah. um, and it's a means of survival. And just because we come from more privileged circumstances where as younger people maybe we yeah. have more opportunity to speak out. People with Kiwi accents. Yeah. New Zealand accents. We yeah. Can we face less judgment. We say. Yeah. I also just think about that vigil in Auckland a week after the attacks mm. and it was completely Muslim and Indigenous speakers and there was a lot of anger, a lot of comparing what happened in relation to colonisation as another thing that's happened as a result of colonisation and just all the people that walked out because they weren't ready to be confronted with that. Mm. But within that, there were Muslim people that walked out and there were people of colour that walked out and I just think there's something... I don't know what, but it's like you have to strike a balance between the anger that's so valid and communicating a message with the empathy it takes to have it received, even if mm. it hurts you, even if it's not fair that you have to demonstrate that sometimes for the greater good, which mm. is a terrible term, you have to do that. I understand what you mean. Okay. I also think that for people who are grieving, it's it takes longer to go to anger like the journey of I can't believe this has happened mm. and the sadness. Sometimes you don't reach your anger quite so quickly. Yeah. So only a week after March 15th, Masuma took Alian down to Christchurch to help with the relief effort, to give comfort to the families suffering there, um, to share space with them and, yeah, just be there in that time. I cried actually as soon as the plane touched um, Christchurch. I'm not. I'm not sure why. Like you know, when I was in Auckland, I was thinking, oh, it would be like so emotional walking into Al Noor Mosque. But as soon as we walked inside, it was very surreal, but it was very peaceful at the same time. Because imagining that so many people died here only some time ago, it didn't had like that feeling of like terror or anything. It was like so much positivity and light. People have brought like those people who have been visiting Muslim or non-Muslims. That that place I think is very sacred to me now. My first interaction was with um, mother of the four-year-old Mukat. I don't know whether he was three or four, yeah. And I remember she was just like standing there like strong and tall and and as soon as I approached her, I hugged her and she was like, um, he belonged to Allah, he belonged to God and he went back to him. And I was like, wow, like a mother saying that about a three-year-old. It was like, Wow. And that's what pretty much made me think, who am I to cry and shed tears when these people who have lost, like family members, they're so strong. So I had to show. And I think this is where I got my strength from. And um, and that's what kept us going. And, and what about the vigil that um, the seniors organized yeah, so, at school? Um, the seniors organized a vigil under the bridge. So we got um, candles and then it was like in the shape of a heart. And you you did like a small I did like contribution. A half a minute speech. So did you feel emotional? I just said that um, a lot of the families they were refugees and then they came to New Zealand as like a safe place and to escape all the violence in their home countries. And then for that to happen to like mainly immigrants, it was kinda mm. it was kinda really sad. I don't think we're really aware of the effects of March fifteenth. I don't think we really understand the price that we paid as a country that mm. day. And I don't just mean because of how many people were killed, how many people were injured, how many families were, like, torn apart. But since March 15th, there's been more attacks against people of colour. Mm. It's like white supremacists feel bolder. Yeah. Yeah. And there's like white supremacist signs and groups popping up across uni campuses, mm. um, which is really scary that people have, rather than realise that there's no place for this in New Zealand, actually they're like, well, if someone did it, people are out there that think like me. Yeah, I feel like also um, there's something about reporting on these hate crimes that isn't always useful as well. Like, I feel like it's been kept out of the news a bit because people know that mm. this encourages, you know, and then I'm like, copycats. do we even talk about it? Yeah, but it's a copycat thing, hey. So 
I feel like I'm hearing about it because I have friends who are Hindu, friends who are Muslim, people who are, this is happening to their communities and they are talking about it. But I feel like some of my white friends don't know this stuff. You know, don't know about Mm -hmm. like gardens and Hindu temples being destroyed a week after Christchurch because they don't orbit around people who worship differently to them. So, I think there's something to say about how we as a country deal with memory and forgetting and collective consciousness. Like, this country's been through a lot of trauma and we deal with historic amnesia where we don't tend to remember all the trauma that we face and we only remember the good parts. And I've heard when people talk about Christchurch, a lot of the things that they say they praise what a great leader Jacinda was. Like, that's their memory of Christchurch. And if that's your memory of Christchurch, you've done the forgetting already. Mm. You're only trying to remember something positive, which is actually just such a fragment of the entirety of what happened. So I think as a country, we need to re-look at how we deal with trauma and memory and remembrance, because otherwise we can't really process and move on. Who are we uplifting in that story? A white woman, once again. And what's the point of that? The point is that all we're doing is centering a white saviour in this narrative that was caused by a white supremacist. In order to make New Zealanders feel comfortable. Exactly. In this next section, Masuma and Alian talked a little bit about their trip to Arbane last year. Arbane, which translates to 40 days, is one of the largest pilgrimages on earth, where up to 45 million people, mostly Muslim, walk approximately 92 kilometres to Karbala in Iraq. So um, one of the things that we both share uh, in common is our passion for travelling. But I think we are good travel buddies. And last year, we decided to go for Arbain, our walk from Najaf to Karbala in Iraq. So firstly, I was planning to go. And then later on, like Alian, you said that you wanted to come Mm -hmm. as well, right? Last minute. Yeah, last minute. Alian was like, I really, really, really want to come. But you had already done that once, so you know what it was like. Yeah. But... The reason I wanted to take you was uh, because the two years before that we did it together, it was a really good time of us doing something for our faith. And it is like a spiritual journey that you make. Considering I've been there before and I've done it before as well. Um, it was great. There were a lot of people, 24 million people there. Mm. And knowing that you're one of those 24 million and thinking how in a crowd, you're just one of them. And you don't know that the person next to you who's walking, maybe they're from a different faith, or maybe like a different background. Like The way we do it is we walk in the night because it's easier since it's not as hot. So we would probably walk from 11 to 3. So we have like a early morning, late night prayer. We do that and then we'd sleep until 9, 10-ish and then walk from 10 o'clock to around... Mm. Three, four o'clock. Yeah. It's really good for your fitness. Yeah. yeah. Keep keep walking and then... Yeah. Yeah, do the same thing. And then um, all the people serving you on the side. So uh, there's like a straight road leading to Karbala and then everyone is walking in one direction. Mm-hmm. And on mm-hmm. one side, there are these accommodation places which are called Mokkip. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the halls and the places which are serving food, they're just open to everyone. And they're serving actually good food and lots of tea, right? Yeah. Lots of chai. Heaps of tea. Heaps of chai. Because in order to keep yourself hydrated, you will just have like lots of chai on the way. And everything is free. And then we'll take a um, break every hour. Yeah. We'll sit down and have a cup of tea. Yeah. And meet the people. And then and there are lots of activities going around as well. Yeah. yeah it's like a festival. Yeah. yeah. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so we can sort of practice the same things when we come back home. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I feel um, what we did at Arbain, Alian, this is, I think that's what made us strong enough to sort of come back here mm-hmm. um, yeah. and then do what we did for Christchurch, right? Because I feel like all those attributes that we learned 
and we promised that we are going to practice we sort of like got a practical ground to practice those things and for me um when 15 march happened i was like okay like you know this is what we are going to do we are going to thank all those people who who made a difference we are going to show our gratitude and we are going to show um our love and stand with the right people So we just wanted to say thank you to Alian and Masuma for demonstrating such graciousness in the face of all that you've both had to deal with in your lives, but especially in the last year. Um, yeah, we also want to acknowledge that now is a particularly hard time to be open about your experiences as a Muslim person in New Zealand. So we really want to thank Masuma and Alian for doing so and for doing so within this podcast. You can check out photos and videos of all our participants on Instagram at Convos with Mai, on Facebook at Where Are You From Really, and on RNZ's website. Conversations with My Immigrant Parents was created, produced, and directed by Julie Zhu and Saray De Silva. Recorded by Joey Siasoko, sound engineer by Colleen Brennan, with original music by Tal. Our cover illustration is by Ngaumutania Jones at Ms. Mimo, with design by Sonia Milford. RNZ supervising producers are Sarah Vuitalitu and Justin Gregory. RNZ senior commissioner on this project is Kay Almers. Conversations with my immigrant parents was made possible by the RNZ NZ On Air Innovation Fund. He kōnai ipurangi tēnei mō te reo irirangi o Aotearoa.